Hey everybody, I'm back again. Before I get started, I just want to thank everybody who commented on Reddit, who subscribed from my last video. I really appreciate all the, the feedback I got. A lot of it was really positive and it made me really feel a lot more confident about what I'm doing right now with regards to my business, the future, and also with regards to making videos for YouTube. I promise you, not all my videos are going to be here in my cafe. Once everything kind of gets sorted a little bit, I'm gonna go out and do a lot more videos outside and do some other interesting stuff. For those that don't know, I've spent about eight years in China. During my time in China, I've been able to do a lot of really interesting things. In my most recent job before this cafe, I was working for a wedding company. Now this wedding company is supposedly the largest wedding company in the world. I got hired with this wedding company because A, I'm a photographer, B, I'm a foreigner, <laughs> and see the, the boss of the company wanted a kind of a foreign assistant and also somebody to help develop foreign markets outside China. So a few years back, he hired me and right around the time I got started in this job, um, we met with a, an Australian filmmaker called Olivia. Uh, actually, she's a photographer and she was working on her first feature length film documentary. She asked us if she could come and interview us and, and film us a little bit. And it kind of turned out, it spilled over into her and her crew were following us for, you know, about a year actually. And we ended up being kind of major characters in her first feature length documentary. Today, what I want to do is I want to show you some clips from the documentary, comment on the clips, kind of give you my reaction and my thoughts of what was really going on, and give you my feeling about what it's like to be in a documentary. Obviously, a documentary is gonna show only what they wanna show. A documentary is gonna be edited very selectively. They're gonna to put together a story. Now, I do wanna say, I think that I was edited very fairly. I'm not saying that Olivia or her editing team represented me poorly or our company poorly, but I do wanna kind of give a, a commentary about, about the, the scenes that I was in. I do highly recommend that you watch the entire documentary. I'm only going to show parts that involve us. There's other characters that they follow, other storylines. And I, I do think it's a fairly interesting documentary, especially if you're kind of unaware of what the wedding industry is like in China. I was hoping to do this, this YouTube video after the documentary was available on, on a lot of different platforms, like specifically Netflix or Amazon Prime. As far as I know, they're still not available, um, but it's available on iQIYI in China. So I took some clips from that and I'm just gonna go through them. And I apologize in advance because I don't have a proper screen capture device, so I just recorded my screen with the computer's audio, and so it's not great audio quality, but it'll get the job done. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's get started looking at the first clip that involves our company and involves me from the film China Love, directed by Olivia Martin McGuire. <laughs> I just uh, sit here to see and to hear to to how to say everybody to report for me every day we are have two thousand customer adhere to booking pay one person ten thousand so one day we are have uh, two twenty mi twenty million income but what if someone buys the Every year, I give uh, three cars for uh, for staff. Uh, three cars. Yeah, three cars. Yeah. And uh, money. And the uh, cash. And I introduce for you. <laughs> and when he says cash, I told you the big checks, but also big stacks of money. <laughs> By very, very famous leader to the world. Yeah. But now I always think that at China to business, not just a business, like a war. What do you think the difference is between the Chinese dream and the American dream? I think it's the same dream. 
life normally. Change your life. Change your life. No poor person, just a poor man. Mm. He don't know how to make money. I can change everyone if I want. And how do you feel about that, Eric? Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, he said that there's one road, you tell me. Right? One road, just follow, follow him, and I can be successful. Or anybody can, really. I should mention before we really start looking at this documentary is you cannot believe everything that you see or hear out of Alan's mouth or out of my mouth in the video. Business in general is, from my experience, a lot of bluster, a lot of exaggeration. Not everything you just saw and not everything you will see is necessarily the truth. It doesn't mean it's a lie, I guess, but it's um, not entirely accurate. All right, so that was the very first scene that you're introduced to me and Alan. Let me just kind of talk a little bit first about how we got involved in this. Um, before Olivia ever had the idea to make a film about weddings in China, she had done, um, I guess, a photo series, still pictures, and it had been received pretty well, so she kind of got the idea to make a, a feature-length film. During that time that she was doing her photo series, she actually met Alan and did a little interview with him. At that time, I wasn't working with the company, um, so she, she didn't meet me. However, when she got the idea to come and do a, a feature-length film, she, she decided to come back and see if she could talk to Alan again, and that's when she met me. Her and a producer or a kind of a fixer uh, locally in China came and talked to me, and they asked, hey, do you think he'd be interested in doing a, a full-length documentary film and being a character, being being followed around for a while. And I wasn't sure if he'd say yes or no. Um, I'd only been with the company for a couple months at this point. But I presented it to him and we talked and, and he said, yeah, 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 sounds good. It'll be good advertising for us. This first scene that you just saw actually um, wasn't the first time that Olivia and her crew came to film us. Um, actually, prior to that, we invited them to Guangzhou. We did a um, promotion with um, Zhou Da Fu, uh, Chao, Chao Tai Fuk, the jewelry company, and with uh, the theme park down there, um, Chonglong, Chonglong, uh, Le Yuan, the, the theme park, whatever it is down there, roller coasters and white tigers and stuff. And what we did was a, um, a big party, like a, a group wedding. It was supposedly the, the largest aerial group wedding ever, not a Guinness World Record because we didn't invite them, I guess. But um, they have a, like a cable car across the park, like the people mover. And so we put a bunch of couples, one couple in every, in every people movie, every, every people mover, every car, and they did a wedding for every couple. So it was probably like 100 couples, I don't know, all up in the air at one time doing a wedding. So that was the first time that um, they actually came in and followed us around but they didn't interview us. Now the next time we were, we were back in Shanghai was this scene, and actually you can probably tell we were both completely either still drunk or hungover. Actually that morning we'd flown back from Jakarta, from Indonesia, because we were trying to expand the business outside of mainland China. That was kind of my job with the company. So we had just flown to Indonesia. We'd met with this uh, Chinese Indonesian, uh, supposedly a really rich guy, but I got a story to tell about him at the end of this. So stay tuned for that. So anyway, we went to meet him. We are having whiskey, having um, cigars, Cuban cigars, doing the, the whole businessman thing, meeting with him for a day. I think we were there for a day. And we looked at some um, retail locations for a photo studio. And we got completely drunk. And then we flew back all night. On the plane, we got drunk. And then Olivia and her crew came in the morning to film us. <laughs> this was the first time that they came to actually interview us. So I was feeling pretty like garbage. And you can probably tell Alan in the, in the clip is also looking pretty bad. It's funny because she, she says, oh, you guys look great, or Alan, you look great. Uh, I'm assuming she was being sarcastic, but that's for her to tell you if she ever comments on this. So it's, this is also the first time that you can kind of get a sense that Alan thinks uh, the business is a war. Oh, he talks about the five generals and he mentions a little bit about how it's kind of like a battle. You'll see throughout the film that he really looks at it like and he's a great general leading his troops through through to the other side. That clip out of the way, let's move on to the next one. Yeah. 
too tight. How about this back? What's this for? A little romantic? <laughs> Lying there, Lee. <laughs> Now it's 2.49. It's all right. Fashionably late, right? Except the stars are there, so we should hurry up. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our, our founder, Shi Jiahao, Alan Shi. He is the person that made this all happen. Alan's vision is, is truly amazing. Uh, from you know one small studio to, to this and to worldwide uh, expansion, artist studio is where, where your dreams come true, where people, they come to get their pictures taken and they, they become a princess. That's our, our slogan, choose artist studio to become a princess but we treat you like a celebrity. If you don't want to be a princess, you can be a star. If you don't want to be a star, you can be anything you want, and we give it to you. That's what makes us different. Okay, so the second scene. Like I said, I was in charge of kind of expanding our business outside of mainland China. So I was almost going every weekend, or every week at least once, to Hong Kong looking for locations for our studios, helping to plan a studio there, and hire staff, and do all that stuff to be in charge of opening a photo studio in Hong Kong. We ended up finding a, a location in um, Causeway Bay on Hong Kong Island. It's a really great location, a really beautiful space, expensive as hell, but that's Hong Kong. Um, so in order to promote our new studio opening, we had a a grand opening party. We always have a grand opening party. We invite a lot of celebrities every time we do any kind of event, usually every month. We would have kind of a party, have at least one celebrity that we paid a bunch of money to come and walk on the red carpet and take some pictures with the boss. At this event, because I was in charge of the studio opening, I was in charge of planning it. I was the director of international development for the company. I was supposed to give a speech. So maybe a week before the grand opening, Alan, my boss, he gave me kind of uh, three or four key points for the speech that he wanted me to, to hit. So I wrote a speech, I typed it out, I practiced it, I practiced it, I practiced it. I'm not a person that likes to give speeches, I really hate being in front of a bunch of people. Um, I'm not a great speaker, as you can probably tell, but I was prepared for this speech. So the night before we flew to Hong Kong, Alan said, throw that speech away, I don't want you to do that speech. First of all, I don't want you to have paper. I don't want you to read it. I want you to just speak from the heart, speak off the cuff, number one. And number two, the key points I told you to talk about, I don't want you to talk about those anymore. Now I want you to talk about our slogan. Our slogan was uh, choose artists to become a princess. So he wanted me to give like a one or two minute speech, not that long, but kind of about the slogan and what it means to me. And, and to be honest with you, I am terrible at corporate bullshit, corporate doublespeak, corporate propaganda, especially if I don't really believe in it. Like, I'm not gonna be choosing this product. The product is fine, I like it, but, you know. Second, I don't wanna be a princess. And I don't even think that it really makes you feel like a princess, you're just taking pictures. Anyway, a, a lot of it I didn't necessarily, like, my heart was not necessarily in. Like, I enjoy the business, but kind of like the propaganda part, the marketing part, it's not really for me. The night before, we were drinking in Hong Kong. We just arrived in Hong Kong, we went to the hotel bar. Uh, pretty much every night we drank. Um, and so we were drinking, getting drunk, and he said, throw away your speech, don't read it, I want you to go up there, talk about this, only talk about this. And I was like, crap, now I gotta think of something new. I'm gonna write it down, I gotta practice it again so I don't go up there and stuff up. But, you know, we ended up drinking through the night, got really drunk. The next day, probably woke up at 10 or 11 a.m. and went to go wake my boss up and get him ready for the party. So my speech is pretty embarrassing. You can see part of it in this video. I was just kind of like, oh, I don't know, choose to become a princess, become a star, become a celebrity. The end. Uh, so it was pretty embarrassing and I wish they wouldn't have used that in the film, but again, I can't control it. At least they didn't put the whole speech in there because that would have been really bad. Okay, so that was the second scene and um, one other thing that's kind of a funny story is uh, 
So we rented the W Hotel for the party in Hong Kong, and um, the room, the room that my boss was in, you could see with the big bear, with the, the SM bear, the chain. Um, it had like a pool table, it had two bathtubs. It was a massive room, it was like the suite at the W. I think it cost 20,000 Hong Kong dollars for one night. So that was where my boss stayed. And then the funny thing about that is, so I was the director of international development. I was in charge of all this planning. I was in charge of all this. And I, they booked me a room at that W Hotel, just a regular standard room. It's fine, I'm, I don't need a suite, it's fine. For months and months and months after this, uh, this party, this stay at the hotel, the accounting department for my company kept on trying to get me to pay for the room. They said that I stayed in the wrong room even though I just went where they told me to go because um, we have people that arrange everything, you know, they arrange the rooms, they, they said I stayed in the wrong room, my room was too expensive, they wanted me to pay for it. And I was like, you know, it's not very much money, it's like 600 Hong Kong dollars or something, or 600 RMB, I forget, but it's the principle of it, and I know sometimes you gotta stand by your principle. And so I never paid, and they were mad at me. Even when I ended up quitting, they're like, what about that money for the hotel? I wouldn't say it's typical of Chinese companies that are kind of petty like this, but from my experience in a couple different companies in China, it is kind of generally like this. It could be the same everywhere else in the world. I kind of built my career here. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it's like other places, but in China I found that some of the business practices are a little bit petty. But what are you gonna do? Okay.
深切印象。拍摄当天毫无化妆师没有根据客人脸型做发型，对此表示不满意，责任化妆师正下天。好，包总，很难找这个。好，但是我们也不找任何原因，我们还是继续想办法删掉。好，一样的，还本正常。税务承担，先把马志东。这个我觉得很有效，呃，之前罚款是扣薪水，开会的时候让他拿钱呢，可能他会面子上觉得，哎呀，好像很那个 lost face， 所以他会觉得第二次改改变呢就很很快。So the next scene is the 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 meeting scene. Every Thursday, every single Thursday, no days off. Every Thursday. The company had a meeting, company-wide, all the managers and the entire company, managers of makeup artists, managers of photographers, managers of wedding studio, uh, wedding halls, managers of uh, bridal salons, every manager in the company had to be at this meeting either in the building in Shanghai or via webcam, via WeChat or whatever software they were using. Every Thursday, it would literally go from 10 a.m. until 5 or 6 p.m. with one break for lunch and to, to pee. And you couldn't get up and leave to pee like anytime you want. They even locked the back doors, so if you did get up, you had to go through the front doors. They would chain them shut, and they would lock it and not let anybody out. And so we'd sit there all day for hours and hours and hours. Every Thursday, first uh, listening, listening to Alan speak, um, and he's kind of like a Kim Jong-un or a Donald Trump figure. He's got like a cult of personality. He wants everybody to praise him. He wants everybody to think he's the best and the smartest. So all the time he's talking, you have to have your phone away, of course, but you have to give him utmost attention. Every time he says something good, you have to applaud, stand up, just really have to praise him and praise him and praise him and give him face, give him Mianza. He gave us this amazing opportunity, right? So we have to give him the face. We have to give him respect for giving us this job, this career, and these really great opportunities. At least that's the that's the perspective. So we would sit in there for hours, and he can talk. He's a guy who can talk and talk and talk. He can talk for three or four hours straight without looking at a speech. Talk about basically nothing. I mean, he really is a lot like Trump in that he can just off the cuff riff about random stuff and kind of look like he knows what he's talking about. He does know a lot of things. He's a smart guy. He's definitely smarter than Trump. Um, but he has the same kind of leadership, public speaking qualities, where he just, I'm gonna talk about this and for 20 minutes and it doesn't really mean anything, but it sounds good. So we dealt with that every Thursday. And then the fine situation, um, yes, every Thursday, they would read the, the bad comments on, on the internet. Any bad comment would receive a fine. So the manager or the makeup artist or the photographer, they would fine from their salary. That's how you made people lose face because face is the most important thing, right? So you would make people lose face by finding them, by embarrassing them in public, and hopefully they wouldn't do it again next time. My hopes when I came to China was uh, stay here for a year and see how it goes. And so and now it's five years, and I think that uh, I think in the beginning, at least for me, in the beginning. Um, before I came here, I was like, yeah, maybe one year. And then after about a month, I was like, I really like it. Like, I, I feel accustomed to life here already. And he always tells me, oh, you're gonna get so much money. And, you know, like, he's good at inspiring, like, uh, hope and everything in you, so. The dream is America, so. The, yeah. <laughs> It's different now. He hit another city and he hit another 20 million people. Yeah. Our boss is a big financial genius, so <laughs> I believe there is a lot to learn from him. Yes. All action cut you, hold on. I think this industry has never been able to see a person. Just like today, he's coming to interview me, I'm very nervous. Why can he make such a good job? I think sometimes, sometimes it's not just for money. Maybe I think at this moment, there are 7,000 employees, and there are 300 stores in the world. There are about 6-7 cities in the world. Our title is the title. 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 
born in Shanghai. His mom was a teacher and his father was an engineer, I believe. He says he only had maybe six months of the year to choose. The house was too small for his whole family. They were sleeping on the ground in the hallway. Just eat rice every day. Very poor, very kind of pitiful existence. And he, but he saw, you know, he saw everything, all the lights in the big city of Shanghai. Uh, this was, you know, 20 years ago. And, and then he, he wanted the same thing that everybody else seemed to have in his, in his eyes. And that's when he says he kind of saw his future being different. It was another kind of epiphany for him. Like, I don't want to worry about, you know, loose change in the ground. I don't want to, I want to be, do something more, do something better. And so that was his goal. A little bit farther into the movie, obviously, and farther into my career with the company. And we've since moved to a new office building and a new wedding hall. And that's where that scene takes place. I don't have much to say about this clip except when they ask me what is like Alan's dream, and I say it's America. Um, I personally knew Alan better than anybody else. The other two guys were standing there, um, Baluha and Bowden. Great guys, but they didn't spend as much time with Alan as I did. Alan doesn't like to share information about his family, and I will continue to respect his wishes, but I can say that America and having his family there and having an American passport and kind of making his fortune in China and leaving China is more his dream than not. Um, so I didn't get a lot of time to elaborate on that because of editing and you know I don't know what his dream is now. It could be different. I would say that from my perspective America is more his dream. Okay so what he says is um, you know in America a rich person can do anything and I feel like in any country a rich person can do anything but you know, he wants to fly planes, and he wants to, like, private planes, and he wants to shoot guns, and he wants to do things that are a little bit harder to do in China. He even talked about, oh, if I get rich, you know, enough, I can, I can fly a helicopter from, you know, my apartment building to my workplace in New York, if I have an office in New York. You know, he, he thinks those kind of, like, goals are realistic and possible and fun and not, and not really possible in China necessarily. He wants face, he wants Mianzi. He always says, Mianzi is the most important thing. And face is most important. Why are you doing the guns? Put them in his bag and put them somewhere. It's okay. I, mean, I think, yeah, of course, he wants a better image for himself. But on the other hand, this is the image he gives to everybody. So he's a very public figure. Uh, he's the face of the company. and. He's just very protective of his image. He just doesn't want anybody to really know anything about him besides what he controls. He said, he said to this guy, he said no more questions. He said you can follow him if you want, but don't okay. want to. Okay. He said just follow him because he's got many things to do. I think Alan would love to be himself around you or the public or anybody else, but he's you know, just worried about his image. He's worried about, you know, if he if he's portrays himself as soft to you, then what about his employees? Are they going to think he's soft as well? He kind of rules with an iron fist at times, and I think he just he wants to maintain his, his status. Just stop. 
after another school. Yes, this is the first time to meet Eric. He should have come earlier, he should have come earlier. This time we will meet in Los Angeles. 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 我们一定会在不久的将来成为全球最大的跟结婚相关的最大的销售公司。啊，因为我觉得这个穷和现在有钱，我说再学一次，我还是想当有钱人。啊，我觉得说我的出生也是穷人，之后经历了很多事情以后，自己觉得。今天，今天再选一次，我还是想做一个有钱人。啊，是因为当穷人的时候太痛苦。其实，呃，只想告诉他，我觉得在在中国，只要你努力，还是有机会的。啊，关键你要努力，啊，不能太平庸，啊，不能太消磨你的时间。So this next scene is pretty much the last scene that involves us. For me personally, it's probably my favorite scene of us in the in the movie. It's the one where I could be most real. I think she kind of got how I was feeling about my job and my my life at that time. Even though I don't talk about it necessarily, you can kind of see it in my face. I think this is the one time in the movie that I wasn't hungover and I wasn't drunk, and I just felt I I feel like I could see my really true. Unhappiness coming through, and also, can I also had a chance to in that part to talk about Alan a little bit deeper than I usually was able to.、Um, at that time, it was just before our annual party, and we we're at our new wedding hall, and we had our annual party there, and I was just not particularly happy at that time with my life, and I was tired, I guess. I was a little bit tired of always having to put up a facade for for my boss, for Alan. He always talks about face. He always talks about mians. I swear, every day he would say, "Face is the most important thing. You never want to lose face. You never want to show weakness. You want everybody to think that you're rich and powerful and kind and special, intelligent." And I just felt tired of of putting up with that. Not putting up with him necessarily, just always trying to be fake. Because you know he's a complicated guy, and always being powerful and always being on business is not really who he is. When the cameras were around, he had to be. When his staff are around, he had to be. But when it's just me and him, and he could kind of let loose a little bit, when we could just go have dinner together, go have a drink together, just us two, and could see like who he really was, he's a, a decent guy. For the most part, <laughs> at, at those kind of times, he's a decent guy. At that point in my career, I was really over it. That was towards the end. Actually, the the timeline of the movie kind of follows the timeline of, of me. She followed us. Her crew followed us for about a year. I was with the company for a little over a year and a half. But from when they first started like talking to us about it to the end, and then when I went to go see the the premiere at the Sydney Film Festival, I had just quit. Right when I went to go see, go to the premiere of the film, and I'm going to talk about that in a second too. Okay, a couple more things to talk about.、Uh, I mentioned the Indonesian Chinese guy earlier, so we kept on going to Indonesia because we wanted him to invest in our company, to invest in a photo studio in Indonesia. We were trying to find a couple different investors, but this guy was kind of our, our target because he supposedly was very rich, powerful, connected in the government, and could help us there. We never actually. Opened a studio in, in, in Indonesia, and a few months after I quit my job, we kind of gave up on Indonesia from what I had heard.、Um, but maybe this guy hadn't talked to my boss recently, or 
he didn't know that I was no longer with the company anyway. So he messaged me on WeChat. I was actually in America and I got a message from him. And he said, hey, bro, how you doing? What are you up to? Blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he said, can you send me 120,000 RMB? And I'm like, uh, no, why? What's going on? And he said, well, I got into a bit of trouble with the government here in Indonesia and with some other kind of bad guys, some, some, some heavy hitters, I guess, some mob guys. And he said, if I don't come up with 120,000 RMB um, within the next 24 hours, then they're gonna break my legs or put me in jail or beat me to a pulp, is basically what he said. So I was like, this guy who supposedly has millions and millions and millions of dollars to invest in us is coming basically to the assistant of a guy that we never actually worked with to try to get money, he's that desperate for money. Um, so I don't know what he got himself into, but that was kind of an interesting thing. I told him no, and I haven't heard from him since. I have no idea if he's okay, if he got the crap kicked out of him, or if he's in prison, what's going on. So there's that guy. Interesting thing to think about. And then, uh, so one other thing about the documentary, I went to the premiere of the film at the Sydney Film Festival, and there was, uh, you know, the director was there, um, producers, some other people that were involved in making of the film. My boss didn't go, and I had just quit the job. So I went to Sydney and I watched the film, and after the film there was a Q&A and an after party. So during the Q&A, everything was fine. I answered a couple questions, people gave me polite applause. Okay, perfect, no problem. And then at the after party, I was there having some wine, some hors d'oeuvres, and talking to people. And this lady comes up to me, this old lady, maybe 60 years old, old to me, right? And she says, I just want to tell you that you are an evil, despicable man. I said, me? Me? Like, wow, is that really how I came across in the film? I thought I, thought I personally came across relatively decently considering the situation I was in. I wasn't the, the one finding people or treating everything like a war or or leading a group of people like I was a dictator. I was just working. I mean, I guess that's what the Nazis say, right? Like, I was just doing my job. But really, I was just doing my job and I wasn't doing anything that terrible as far as I'm concerned. There were things that I didn't agree with morally. One of the main reasons why I left the job. But if you do watch the movie, I would love to see what you think about if I came across as evil or how you believe that I was portrayed in the film. I felt like I was one of the sympathetic characters in the movie. There's a few sympathetic characters in the movie, and then there's kind of like the bad guy in the movie, which was my boss. But even then, in the movie, he wasn't really that bad compared to like how he would have been if there was no cameras on him, because he's a very hardcore, take no prisoners kind of boss. But so yeah, if you do watch the movie, or if you saw these clips and you have an opinion, let me know what you think. I would love to hear how other people saw me portrayed in the film. I think that it's really a difficult job to, to edit a, a documentary, to tell a story that's compelling. I think that Olivia and her crew did a really good job, like kind of giving the basic information of how wedding industry and weddings in China are. My only issue with the actual film itself is that I felt like, especially our scenes were very, they're very superficial and it's not necessarily their fault. I think part of it is because Alan, my boss, always has his guard up, and so we couldn't really get deep into what he's about. But there were times that I tried to explain and try to be a little bit more um, in depth about what we were going through, what we were doing, what we were experiencing, and it didn't necessarily make it onto the screen except in the last scene, like I talked about. Okay, and now my final thought about being in a documentary, what that experience was like, and kind of my takeaway is that one, I. I don't have a bone to pick with the director or the producer or the, the team there. I understand it's their film, they own the rights to it, they own the rights to all the footage. But I did go through a, a kind of a rough patch during that time that they were filming. Uh, my father passed away and right after he passed away, they did an interview with me in which, you know, I cried, I really, it was really opened up, I talked about my dad. and. I understand why that's not in the movie. I completely understand that. But I did ask for um, the footage. I asked for the raw footage, the interview, just for my personal use. Or like, I mean, like, I, that's probably the most raw and real I've ever been talking about my feelings and about my family. And I would love to just have that. Just not a memento. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, and I asked for it a couple times, and I kind of got the runaround. 
And if you guys do see this, um, Olivia and your team, I would still love to have that footage if you have it somewhere. Um, and my only other thing about the being in a documentary is that, you know, they were with us for about a year, usually at least a few times a month, sometimes even a few times a week, um, for hours at a time. And we only got about, you know, 10 to 12 minutes in the final film. And so I understand you're trying to make a narrative. I totally get it. Being a filmmaker is hard. And so for all that work that they put in, not just following us, but following other characters as well. And I wish there was more of it. I just wish there was more. It's an hour and 20 minute film. I could have watched two hours or two and a half hours personally because one, it's like, it was my life. Um, and two, because I find it interesting and I would have liked to see it a little deeper level. But overall, I think it's a really good and interesting look at weddings in China. And I urge everybody to go look at it. And after you watch it or after you see this, please comment on my video. Let me know what you think. You can watch it on ICE. There was also a version that was shorter, an hour long on ABC in Australia. There's probably other ways to watch it as well. So watch it and let me know. Again, thank you all for watching. If you've made it this far, it's my longest video ever. And please don't forget to subscribe, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you don't like it. And that's all. I'll see you next time. Take it easy.